Okay. I think. All righty, everyone, welcome. Welcome to Food and Fantasy. And I am Amanda Justice, the moderator, and I'm super excited for today's panel. And um, so I would like to begin by saying that thank you to everybody that has come to a CornCon event and the, um, sorry, I'm getting my screens ready. Thank you to everybody that's come to a QuarnCon event so far. We have had a fantastic five days of programming, everything from, um, you know, starting with my own panels. We had tropes and sci-fi and fantasy. We've had world building with some of the, you know, most well-known up and coming authors in fantasy and science fiction today. We have had um, a massive amount of programming with readings and contest announcements and everything that you can think of over the last five days. And if you missed anything, you can still catch it on YouTube. And our schedule is on corncon2020.com. So please be sure to check it out. Um, I would really, really excited for today's panel. It's food and fantasy. And we came together to talk about, uh, we invite a lot of authors who feature food in their work and so that's cool and but we're here to talk about what food means to us personally and how we use it in our work and why it um, can make fantasy really come to life much more than um, some other world building aspects. So we this panel is to whet your appetite and tickle your taste buds. It's going beyond bread and stew. It's a discussion of how to use food as a world building tool and why food and fantasy is not just a meaningless detail. And I'd like to start uh, by having each panel introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about your work and tell us why food is important to you personally. And I am going to start with Intisar. <laughs> I was really hoping you wouldn't start with me. <laughs> So my name is Intasar. Um, I write young adult fantasy. I have an indie series out called The Sunbolt Chronicles. And my latest release is actually through Harper Teen. It's called The Theft of Sunlight. It's a little bit of a brick. Um, and um, what does food mean to me personally? I mean, mostly food is fuel. <laughs> Which is probably the, the wrong answer for this panel. I'm not much of a foodie. <laughs> I hate cooking. I do enjoy a good meal. Um, but food is, is important to me in that um, I associate certain foods with certain, certain aspects of my life, right? So, you know, holiday food is holiday food. Um, for me, it's a particular like Pakistani foods um, that I want when we have our holidays. Um, there, when I went off to boarding school and I was homesick, I dreamt of the beef and potatoes, the alu gosh that my mom would make. And, and it was, that was it. So food, food set in as, as a, a, a metaphor, if you will, for, for home and for comfort. Um, and I think that's true for many, many people. Um, my daily life, I just want to fuel up and keep writing and working. <laughs> But I think it has it has cultural and emotional resonance, and I definitely try and capitalize on that in my books. Awesome, Angela. How about you? Um, I'm Angela Board, and I write the Aterian Empire series, which uh, Fortune's Fool was a Spiffo Five finalist. It's this one, and it's you know, very large, but, um, and then I have the second, well, it's a standalone novella, Smuggler's Fortune. So those are the two books in the series now, which are kind of twisty Renaissance inspired epics. Um, as far as food goes, there's a, there's quite a bit of food in the books. My characters like to eat, but, um, to me personally, I'm the mother of nine. So, um, I, and seven of them, of them are boys. So, um, I have to cook a lot of food. Like we kind of joke that um, our, you know, regular dinner is kind of like everybody else's Thanksgiving because there are just so many of us, you know, like, um, 
not that I cook a Thanksgiving dinner every day, but I don't do that. But <laughs> um, so there's that. And I also, um, food to me is, I, I mean, I've always enjoyed food. I've always enjoyed cooking. It's always been kind of a, another outlet for creativity for me. But um, about 10 years ago, I developed some food sensitivity issues. And now like I kind of move in and out as far as whether I can eat gluten, how much dairy I can eat, um, I can't eat corn. And that's, that was really hard for me. Um, and especially when you're pregnant and you're nursing as you know, I've had a lot of kids, those issues are, are, are tough to deal with um, through morning sickness and whatever. So I kind of have that kind of issue with food. Like I'd like to eat pretty much everything, but there are things that I can't eat. So I have to kind of figure out ways to like have what I want without making myself sick. So that's me. All right. How about you, Crystal? Uh, okay. So my name is Crystal Matar. I wrote the, or I'm writing the Tainted Dominion series. The first of which is Legacy of the Brightwash. Um, there's quite a lot of food in it. Um, and that one also looks like a really thick one. Yes, it is. It, it's another. <laughs> it's just a group that writes really fat books. Yeah. There, there it is beside Fortune's Fool. <laughs> and then um, I, I have kind of a complicated relationship with food. I've had some lifelong um, health problems that were caused by different food. And then, oh no, also had... Um, financial instability as a young person so I didn't always have enough food so growing up having enough food and having food that was not causing me problems was kind of a struggle so it became um, something that meant a lot to me um, passing down to my own children my four children having making sure that they always had enough to eat and it was fueling their bodies well but also that it had meaning to it because so much of our culture across the world is built on how we feed each other. So um, a lot of that did come into my writing of characters sharing food, which shared meaning. So that's, I think that about sums me up. Cool. How about you, Travis? Um, hey, I'm Travis. I actually don't have my own books with me like everyone else does. I have, um, oh my God, I have The Unbroken by C.L. Clark with me, um, but not my own. Uh, I've written a few like standalone books, um, like Balaam Spring and The Narrows and uh, Spit and Song. And last year I started uh, my first trilogy. Um, actually, an assistant just brought me all my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Here we go. We got Balam Spring. We've got the Narrows. Um, we've got Spit and Song. And then uh, last year I started my first trilogy, uh, Flesh Eater, uh, the Houndstooth trilogy. And book two, uh, Mother Pig, is coming out in June. Um, and I guess for me, uh, food is like, I, I guess just like the ultimate like bonding experience with my friends. Um, that's, that's what I love most about it. That's what I've missed most during the, this whole pandemic is not being able to just like go to a restaurant or a food truck or something with my friends and like try new things and like share stuff with each other. Me and a few of my friends have like a group chat called treat gang. And so we just send each other like links to, to like local restaurant menus and like fast food deals that are happening. And so we're, we're building up the, the like the treat gang schedule for for when we're all vaccinated here in a few weeks so we can go try a bunch of stuff um but yeah that's that's what it means to me i guess is is a good time with my friends awesome how about you kay i'm i'm kay i'm the author of the wolf of orignano which was released by orbit last year and book tree is actually coming out next month and this is this is my brick. <laughs> the first one is not as much of a brick, but the, the last one is. And so for me, food is very much a love language in our culture. So it, the, like just making food for someone is, is associated with like showing how you care. So if someone is sick, that's usually like a like a time when you're cooking them whatever they want and just like 
pampering them. And so if you have guests over, the way that we make our guests feel at home is to just basically feed them so much. <laughs> and then by the time they leave, they're still carrying like a bunch of food with them. And it, a, a lot of this is homemade. So sometimes we do like we do order out, but a lot of our gatherings involve a lot of homemade food. And especially like the, even if somebody invites you, you'll be bringing your own, uh, your own recipe over like potluck style. So I, this, this, this is how I also show a lot of uh, character development in my books, which is like the, just the way they, they eat and j- just like the relationships really show up in around the food culture. Great. And you, you've, uh, you've, you've segued really nicely into our first discussion question, but before we move to that, I'm, I'm gonna wedge my own work in there. Um, I'm Amanda Justice. I'm the author of The Wern Chronicles. There is not actually a lot of uh, food. Um, there's not a lot of dining in those books actually, but um, I love food. Food to me personally is also about family. It's also about um, discovering new things. It's, uh, you know, I love to, uh, my husband and I differ. My husband will go to a restaurant and he'll find one dish that he likes and he will order that every single time we go to that restaurant. And I like to try the entire menu. So, um, and so I just love the, um, the, the flavors and I love unique flavor combinations. And I, and I also love what it tells you about every, you know, individual cultures as you, as you move through different things. Um, I want to point out to our audience that Several of the authors on the panel have provided recipes to us and you can find those in the chat. And so thank you very much to those of you who gave us recipe and we may uh, talk a little bit about those recipes a little further on in the panel. But Kay very suavely and smoothly did address the first question, which is how do you use food in your own fiction? And what purpose does it serve in your storytelling? So. Um, since Kay's already alluded to that, I'm going to go to Angela, mainly because I've read Fortune's Fool and the food in that book always made me really, really hungry. So <laughs> good. <laughs> um, I, I don't, I mean, personally food, like can, in my books, it serves so many purposes. It's like, I guess, because it's a you know, it's a big part of my own life. And, and um, so it's a big part of my character's lives. It's because it's not just, it's not just one or the other, you know, it's, it's character and world building and plot, like all combined together. It's, you know, when characters eat together, they show parts of themselves that they can't really show in any other way, you know, like it's, it's a much more intimate setting like they're eating together and they have the chance to like slow down and talk to each other mm-hmm. about things or they might be eating like in the in, in the new book I'm writing it's a portal fantasy and one character gives the other character a food he hasn't had since he was very small and it was something that he forgot but now he remembers and it brings back his memories of his family which has been broken apart um so it does those sorts of things in, in my books. Um, and it also can be like, you know, it's just, it gives a deeper feeling to the wider world in general, because there are so many things about food that can, you know, show what kind of world they're living in, like what grows in a certain place, how they fix it, who's eating what. Yeah. Who gets the food, I, doesn't get the food. Okay. I think that's so a really- much of it point about memory and it it makes me think of you know there's the famous book remembrance of things past where the narrator is eating a madeline and then in the disney movie ratatouille there's a scene where the um food critic is eating the the ratatouille and he has like that exact same like wash of memory and and bringing him back to his childhood and how it, how that kind of those flavors can really connect us with something. So Crystal and I interrupted you. So go ahead. Uh, 
How do you use food in your in your work? Toby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, you. I um, interrupted you. I you're so going back to Angela. I'm yeah. Taking... Yeah, to add on to Angela, um, who's eating what, what they have access to, and are they getting enough is um, something that off a lot, um, you know, having um, the whole story take place in one city gave me the uh, ability to contrast the really poorest areas of the city versus the very wealthiest areas of the city. Um, and in fact, the main character has an it's, it's not it's not equal it's not a thing that everybody has enough of and it's not a thing that everybody realizes how important it is because of access so that that's something that came in I didn't I didn't mean to get up on a soapbox and talk about it in my book but I I just I don't think I couldn't not talk about it just because I know what it feels like to have too much and I know what it feels like to not have enough mm -hmm. so that 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 became a a part of building society as a whole and how they think about people who aren't getting enough. I want to I want to turn to Intisar because something that you said, Crystal, about the um, you know the character experiencing other people's cultures through food, and and you mentioned that Intisar about and that aspect being really important to you. So does that come into your work? Uh, it does, um, both in terms of um, yeah, specifically in terms of like intercultural interactions um, when you take one person and you put them in another culture um, you know understanding the dynamics of what food means right so at one point I have uh, my character Hitomi who's in Sunbolt um, in, her, in the next book in Memories of Ash she's traveling among the desert tribes and um, her guide ends up like they they get uh intercepted by like essentially an enemy tribes um patrol and um due to the rules of hospitality and because my main character's there and she's a guest they're going to offer these two women safe passage but um but hitomi's guide will refuse to eat the food of her enemy because they're not going to bake bread together right that's an act of peace and she has big beef with these people who literally killed her brother. Um, and, and part of kind of that character's arc is coming to a point where eventually like, can I, can I eat with my enemies? Can I find a way to put away my anger and find a way to build peace? So food is like the act of eating together is an act of trust. It's an act of caring and it's an act of accepting caring um, and giving care. Um, and I think that you see that in a lot of cultures. I was, I was, I was smiling, Kay, when you're talking about like food is a love language in, in many cultures. It's absolutely a love language in, in my culture. And I completely missed the boat on that one. <laughs> and I'm like, um, I'll eat your food. <laughs> but I don't want to cook for anyone. <laughs> yeah. um, there's, there's also the aspect of like people who, who, um, you know, like I'm kind of a fish out of water. Like I'm a product of two different cultures. I grew up in a third culture um, and I can see the <laughs> cultural implications of, of many different things, including food and I appreciate them, but I'm also kind of, I, I can't always navigate them myself very well. Like I'm really, really bad at doing the like super caring through food thing, even though I know that like, Okay, if I invite these people over, I've, I've got to go all out. Then I'm like, I, I can't. I, <laughs> I can't. Maybe we should meet them at a restaurant. <laughs> Pick up the phone. No. <laughs> um, so Your job uh, is to find the best <laughs> you know, provider. <laughs> but um, yeah, so in terms of in terms of my writing, though, I mean, food is fuel. I really worry about characters who don't get fed in their books. Like I, I, I straight up where I'm like, this person is all over, like someone feed them, you know, <laughs> what's happening here? <laughs> like, that's it. I'll feed them. <laughs> you know, the times are desperate when I say that. <laughs> um, so I think there's, there's that aspect of writing of just not forgetting that like food is fuel. It's also has these other dimensional aspects. It gives texture to your world. Uh, like I think Angela said, like what's what's in season where you are? What's the climate? What's the world like? 
mm -hmm. uh, what's happening that builds your whole world out right like my uh, one of my opening scenes in one of my books like my character's running through a fish market and I'm like all right what time of year is it when do they go fishing oh it's night fishing because this is tropics um like what what kind of fish are, like it's all there and it's it's a little scene she doesn't actually eat the fish <laughs> she wants to um <laughs> but there's you know it it creates whole levels of um of of texture and depth and also relationships right so now you have fishmongers and what's the relationship between you know your character and, and the people who have fish and like maybe you know does she get to do odd jobs to occasionally get food because and do they give her more food than that odd job is deserving of and and because they're still trying to care for her but also respect her dignity as someone who's trying to be independent right so there's all these different aspects that you can get into and it all revolves around essentially food so yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, I do do use food a lot in my books, even though I am very practical about it in my life. <laughs> how, about, how about you, Travis? So tell us about how they, how you use food, especially with a, with a book called Flesh Eater. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh <-huh. laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I use it, I guess, a lot uh, in the same way that like I do in my life. Like I mentioned, like bonding experiences with friends. I, I use scenes of like people getting together and eating to like really like slow down the narrative and have the time for the characters to actually like interact like uh normal people do rather than just like fighting a monster or something you know like just sitting down and eating and talking about like their lives or their plans or their families or anything else like that um so you can really like get a, a deeper sense of like who these people are and they're like more normal circumstances and um it is like a really useful world building tool as well because like like angela was saying um thinking about like what kind of food is around like what can be grown what they have access to um mm -hmm. and like specifically in flesh eater it takes place in this valley that's like completely closed off from the rest mm -hmm. of the world so there's like there are no access to like oceans or anything and um actually eating like consuming animals is outlawed so there's like no meat or, or anything like that um so i had to really rethink um about like what dishes i was going to use in the book as opposed to like my previous works um so everything is either like vegetarian or like insect based they they have like companies that farm insects um there so i have like wasp balls instead of meatballs uh stuff like that and there's like a lot of cauliflower steaks being eaten. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think stuff like that can really help you like build out a world and uh, really like immerse you um, in, in that sense of place in a way, in those like small details that maybe you wouldn't really think of otherwise. Great. Kay, do you have anything to add from, cause you only get to have like a snippet. <laughs> Yeah, I can actually go into more detail with that. Like, I, I I can use food or scenes around food to kind of play with attention, because normally we associate food with like a break in tension. It's it's comfort. It's it you know it's fuel, as in the sort of saying it. So nar from a narrative perspective, especially with the way I write my books, which is like really high tension and like like you know, heart racing uh, speed. When you have a moment where the character is eating or being given food by someone, it, it kind of, you know, you can kind of slow down a bit and then depending on what you show, you can kind of draw out certain things like her relationship with, with the people in her life where she's like, I've never been given food like this where somebody like personally prepared it, even like, somebody from a lower class than what she's used to and you know it's it's those things that kind of create depth in the world because it's not mm -hmm. like like I love what Crystal was saying about showing the different classes and how they like how they respond to food and I have a lot of that in my work where it's like people from the lower classes are finding a way to like they, they still have this really colorful like culture even even though like it, it's not 
you know, it, it might be simple as something as simple as a barbecued uh, intestines, which we we have in the Philippines, and it's it's really good. But it it may be something that you know to some people they're like, what's that? But it, but it's you know it's it's a way of showing how people think. Like you you don't waste anything, mm-hmm. you don't waste anything, mm-hmm. and, and then creating that kind of subculture in that world, and then you have this character who is like from an upper class and the way she thinks about food is somewhat different and it's it creates depth it creates contrast and then you know it's just it, it's it's just a great tool to use because you know food is something that we we can all relate to right no matter what culture we're at right right exactly yeah. exactly the um the so what if you can provide some examples of other authors that you think have used food in an effective way, and that includes the use of magic food. So, you know, as I was thinking about this panel, I was thinking of books that I'd read where specifically food itself was magical. And, you know, the probably the most famous example is like water for chocolate. And I know that's magic realism, but food basically really is magic in that book. And also The Stars Dispose, which is a historical novel that's set in um, Renaissance Italy. And um, it's about an artist's apprentice, but Catherine de' Medici as a child is one of the characters. So that's kind of interesting. Anyway, um, so, you know, I don't know if somebody wants to like jump in or have an idea of something where you felt that food was used effectively or I'll call on you. So like five seconds. (laughs) I can jump in with um, Bjorn's book. Bjorn Larson wrote Children, um, which is a retelling of Norse myths. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, in Norse mythology, there's Indun's fruit. And I apologize, Bjorn, if I've pronounced that wrong, but uh, Idun's fruit, it seems to be implied by the Norse myths, and it's certainly implied by his book that it's the source of their immortality. Um, so they need access to the fruit um, constantly, or they begin to age. Um, so I guess it's not necessarily the immortality, but their youth. Um, but he's also used it as an analogy for opioids. So they're both dependent on it and massively addicted to it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really profound use of, of access and over access to food that, um, is also magic. So that was a really good example when you said magic food that was the first thing that came to mind (laughs) and then also Angela she made um I can't remember Angela if Fortune's Fool had the silkworms or if that was later stuff yeah Yeah. that was a great example of food as a society building tool because Mm -hmm. those of you that read it know it's it's built around silk and something's got to be done with all those dead silkworms so they fry them (laughs) up and eat them (laughs) and she was researching what wine pairs well with fried silkworms so like that that that's pretty cool (laughs) that's pretty thoughtful I I thought that's when I knew I was going to be a big fan (laughs) (laughs) it's it's red wine actually if you're going to eat silkworms it's red (laughs) yeah (laughs) did you get down to a grape or did you give up no no (laughs) I, I think somebody said a Merlot, but you know, I don't know. It's, Did you it, do any I, taste testing? No, I didn't. You can buy silkworms off, off Amazon, like because in silk growing cultures, like in, in, in Venice too, this was in Northern Italy, they do, you know, you have a lot of extra dead worms around. And so mm-hmm. they do have recipes for silk silkworms so it was just um <clears throat> that particular scene was a nice way of I wanted something to break the tension in between these two characters because a lot of the times they're very tense together and I wanted to show how they actually got to like each other a little bit more and so it becomes kind of a joke one character plays on the other and it was fun to write I had fun with it how about um, anybody else have a book that they think used food well, magical or otherwise, it can be just regular food too. I, I feel really bad because I, I can't remember the title of the book, but um, but there are other books like this. So maybe it's more of a genre of, of 
where the protagonist or their significant loved one of some sort, mother, sister, brother, love, you know, uh, uh, partner, um, is engaged in a food making trade, especially like being a baker mm -hmm. um, or, or in some way. And, and I, I love it when authors delve into like, how does that, like, what is their personality like? And how does, how does their vocation mesh with who they are? And how does that then impact the flow of the story, right? So if like you have a baker who makes fancy cakes versus a baker who's making like the bread that everyone needs to eat every day, like how does that, how, how do, does what they do or if they do both um, influence like what they do when like the ragamuffin turns up on the doorstep and um, you know, what, like it's just, it's really, um, I really enjoy books like that. And there was one that did it really well and I have lost the name, so I apologize. It's okay. That's that's usually my life. So, what about your pet peeves with food um, in fantasy or in literature in general? I know Antisar, you you said that you had one. <laughs> I'm gonna get right by, right up on my soapbox. So one of the things <laughs> that drives me absolutely wild um, is when you have someone who has been hungry. They come from a lower economic class and all of a sudden they have access to a little bit of money and they decide to go shopping for food in the fantasy world. And they go out and they buy a huge roast and like five potatoes and they're like, I'm going to eat well. And I'm like, today, what about tomorrow? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and what bothers me is this, A, you're not questioning the assumptions. Like why is a roast relatively cheap? here because we have factory farming. Do you have factory farming in your fantasy land? Because if not, that animal had to be fed grain and grasses for up to a year before it could be slaughtered. It had to be brought in from the country to your urban fantasy setting, assuming you're living in the city. Um, like there's a lot of labor, it had to be butchered, it had to be like, you know, all of this labor, all of this cost to raise the animal. There is no way if you have half a brain, you were buying a roast when you just got like, a handful of covers, right? Like, A, you can't afford it. B, you're going to be buying grains. You're going to be, you're not going to go out and buy a loaf of bread because then you're paying for labor, right? You're going to go out and you're going to get your flour and you're going to get your, your grains. And you're going to get your root vegetables. You weren't, you were, if you splurge, maybe. You get some trotters it. maybe or a ca uh, calf's head instead. Some, yeah. Something that was cast off and exactly. it's available for yeah, a penny. So yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, or maybe if you really, really, really want to go all out, you'll buy like one egg. Yeah. That everyone splits, right? Well, and you'll make a cake with it, maybe. Yeah. Cause... But I mean, but really you don't because sugar is uh, any kind of sweetener is yeah. super expensive, right? So it, it like, it just, I want to scream. Or those stories where they like, they, they've been so hungry, they've been without, and then like they get a delivery of like, a crate of food and they have a food fight. <laughs> <laughs> I literally read these books and I'm like, <laughs> wow, no, they're no. hungry. Yeah. They've been hungry. So here's my suggestion if you're watching this <laughs> go be hungry for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> and then have $3 in your mm -hmm. wallet and go to the store. And figure out what you can eat that is not processed and didn't come from a factory farming situation. Mm -hmm. And and now you can answer what your character is going to do. And literally, like, go without food for 24 hours. Are you going to have a food fight? <laughs> so sorry. I'm going to get off my soapbox. Those things really <laughs> bother me. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'll I'll double down on on her pet peeve because it's like I don't think um, a lot of people in a food stable environment realize how precious of a resource it can be, and then also I don't think we realize in our modern age how far things have to travel to come to us mm -hmm. in a city, or mm -hmm. how far they have to come to us if they don't grow locally. So a pet peeve of mine that I see is when it. <sighs> I don't mind it if fantasy books don't mention food at all, if that's not what the writer's interested in. I'd rather they just not mention it and then move on and go to what they're interested in. But sometimes you can see them trying to check the box and what they come up with is so impossible to what the situation they're claiming they have. And it's like, 
if they're in any time older than the last 50 years, um, they're going to be bound to certain seasons. Even if it's a tropical environment, they're still going to be bound to certain seasons of what's available <laughs> and how far that had to come and mm -hmm. how long that lasts. And, you know, and what kind of refrigeration do you have? Is spice uh, an object of wealth in your culture or is spice a necessity because it adds to uh, the preservation cycle of your food? So I would rather an author just, just leave it alone or if if they're going to go into detail they better they better think about it a little bit before they start rattling things off that that bugs me right there with you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah how about you Kay or Travis or Angela any pet peeves in that you read you just go Ugh. that can't happen I don't, yeah, ahead, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think I have any really. I, I don't know. I can't, I can't think of anything. Nothing really irritates you. I think, <laughs> I think you guys have brought up a good, a good point about food preparation in, um, in fantasy. It, it kind of annoys me that like somebody they're out on the, they're, they're living off the land and they go and they catch a rabbit and it <laughs> seems like they spit and cook that rabbit in like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> over an hunting. open fire <laughs> hunting is a another pet peeve i don't think people realize how much time is put into um tracking and finding and and butchering and preparing and dressing an animal like they they act like it's something that you can do real quick right before dinner but it's days right. and and, and even and, just, and you're traveling, you're trying to make progress at the same time. So like hunting as you go is not, not easy. Right. You're, gathering you're, eating, you go, more like. you're eating cedar bark and yeah, <laughs> roots, the dandelion roots. Like, yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah, I have um, in, in one of my books, I have a character who, who does have to, to travel cross country and, and runs out of all of her supplies and has to live off the land. And and at one point, she, it, my world is set on a different planet, but there are a lot of feral cats. Mm -hmm. And so she like, um, and I don't even know if wild cats really have this, but I was sort of stealing the idea from the Warriors novels where the cats have like <laughs> food caches. <Yeah. laughs> anyway, she like robs a cache of, of cats' foods and has to fight the cats to steal their food. <laughs> that they've already caught so and then she eats it raw because you know it's like the fire is a big job lighting a fire is a big is a big deal yeah it's a, especially you know that at the time she's traveling it's like raining constantly so then it makes it even harder to to light yeah. a fire so yeah it's, it's almost impossible yeah yeah, yeah I, I all the people like light fires to warm up after a day of riding through the rain and i'm like where did you get that firewood like right. it, it's it's possible but it's not easy <laughs> and and then they dry off in minutes it's like now have you ever <laughs> you actually have jumped thing. into a swimming pool with your clothes on it's yeah <laughs> it's how long does it take you to dry just naturally yeah Especially if they're wearing a lot of like wool and leather and stuff, or, yeah. or well, like, uncomfortable too. Like yes, let's like let's call out yes. like how miserable this really is. Like yeah, yeah. Oh, and it, by the way, if it, it, we're off food topic now, but if it's the temperature is anything less than probably even seventy degrees, and you're soaking wet, you're gonna be freezing, yeah. and so <laughs> and and you know fantasy characters I would just shrug that off so yeah no <laughs> anyway um Angela do you have any pet peeves or anything you want to talk about in this regard yeah I guess I, I guess I have a couple I um I always kind of find it hard to believe that there's never any food shortages because of the weather in fantasy novels you know it's like it's like they don't ever um because farming is really dependent on that if you've ever tried to grow a garden you know that it it's really hard sometimes like I can't if I had to depend on my garden to feed me we would have all starved a long time we could like eat blueberries in June you know for a while because I have a lot of blueberry bushes and they're good but you know or like you get we have chickens you get chickens and things eat them and then there's no eggs you don't have anything to eat you know so 
And that's that's a pet peeve. And and then I I probably have the pet peeve that a lot of people have, and that's just the the bread and cheese and stew. You know, people in fantasy novels only eat bread, cheese, stew, and porridge, and they don't even say what kind. You know, and I want to know. But um, anyway, that's my pet peeve. <laughs> I think I think uh, that just brought up another thought that I had is that nobody ever gets sick. No one ever gets food poisoning <laughs> in fantasy novels. No, you know, botulism from canned goods. You you. you fact that you said blueberries I was thinking oh you could can them and then you know if you don't know you don't know exactly what you're doing yeah 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 <laughs> and I, I, maybe I, even if you do it could yeah. still go it was a bad off. year yeah yeah I read so. this one um fantasy book some years ago where you know it's post-apocalyptic and this person finds a food cache of canned food that's literally at least 40 years old <laughs> and like rips open a can and <laughs> I think I read that book and I was like <laughs> You are dead. <laughs> this is it, chapter one, and you're you're done. <laughs> I think that happens in the road as well. Yeah, yeah. You found does. like a bunker with like canned goods, and <laughs> there, there's a YouTube uh, streamer. I don't I don't know if he's still active, but uh, he opens uh, K rations from various world wars so the or the sea rations so the canned rations from various world wars and um from about the vietnam war it's about a 50 50 hit or miss um of whether or not those cans are even still good anymore and it's really interesting to see him to react to the cans that are not good anymore <laughs> so just to re- speaking of cans <laughs> I read a sci-fi, well, it was it was billed as literary fiction. It was really sci-fi. It was like where the earth stopped spinning as fast. And so it messed with the climates and it messed, you know, and there wasn't enough sunlight and stuff. And so they all started relying on canned food forever. It was like, but you have Finite to put in the cans. Why, where are you getting the stuff? <laughs> but no, and she's like, and we're all underground and we're all eating the canned food. I was like, but and, and just, the farmers. I, could not, I could not get past that. That was like, couldn't see any of the other plot. I was just like, but wait. <laughs> so that's me. That's the kind of reader I am. <laughs> yeah. It's sometimes it's really, it's, it's really hard. You also don't, you know, they also all seem to like get water from streams, drink it, you know, Giardia or any kind of other intestinal parasites that, problems with that it's just like you know boil your water people <laughs> I, I, it kind of depends though because we, we do a lot of uh, backpacking and we yeah. have gone up the mountains and we have like as long as it's fast moving and yeah. not stagnant yeah but yeah <laughs> if they if they're like drink grabbing a cup and going to a lake and drinking which i have seen people do in real life <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> I swear to God, we've gone up a mountain and there were like, there, there are other hikers and they just like, and they're drinking from a stagnant pool. And I'm like, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'm like fresh from a fantasy novel. <laughs> they're going to learn that. They're going to learn that lesson yeah. really fast. <laughs> I think it's, it's one of the interesting things I, you know, the express, you read in fantasy and historical novels that the expression watered wine and and I learned somewhere that, that that actually is a real thing. And that's one way of, of yeah. sterilizing water and making it drinkable. Yeah, Cause water wasn't safe in urban, urban areas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because people pollute uh, just by their presence. Right. Right. Yeah. So they, they made beer and they made wine um, and the fermentation process killed most of the pathogens, hopefully. Uh, yeah. So that's another thing to think of is who's drinking water. Yeah. Okay. So we are getting down to the wire and I know oh. Travis, we, we've been not letting Travis talk. So Travis, I'm going to start with you. Um, can you describe your favorite fantasy meal or you have the option to read something to us maybe that you've written or that you love um, or just describe it. It's up to you. Um, well, one dish that I've I've wanted to try ever since I read about it um, is from The Expanse, which I guess is sci-fi rather than fantasy. But That's all right. uh, yeah, what I really like about The Expanse 
<laughs> is the uh, how they really do a lot of world building in setting up like what seems obvious in, in hindsight when you like hear about it, but like since so many people like live on an asteroid belt, like they don't obviously like they don't farm cattle there or anything or like grow crops like in the rock. But um, so a lot of their food is just like, like imitations of like meat with like soy proteins or like mushrooms and stuff like that. Or, uh, you know, you, just things along those lines. Um, mm -hmm. And so they, they have dishes called like red kibble or, or like white kibble. Um, and I've always wanted to try those. Like, so white kibble is, uh, it's like, it's made from a soy protein and a mushroom base. And it, it has like a cheese powder on it. And um, they describe it as having a warm and peppery taste and a cheesy aftertaste. Um, and red kibble is like deep fried, um, spiced, like red bean paste balls. I mean, that sounds fun to me, even though it's meant to be, like, not that great of a dish. I, I remember on the uh, show when Naomi cooked it for the uh, Russ yeah. and Auntie crew, and they're all like, oh, and, they're, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, Holden is trying to, like, be the good boyfriend. <laughs> Looks like he's enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, based on their reactions, maybe I don't want it so much, but I, I think it, it sounds interesting. I, I would like to try it. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, Angela how about you favorite meal from a from a um... um I don't know I like um I'm not sure if I have meals that are favorite but I like reading about pantries like what all the stuff like it, I will read a good description of a pantry any day and actually my favorite one comes from a series of kids books like picture books that I have they're called the Brambley Hedge books and they're about these little mice and they they just, it's, it's basically about them storing food. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like all the stories, they get the food, you know, and so it has, and it has these amazing illustrations of like, you know, jam and it's everything's, and I don't know, it just feels very ordered to me to read about a pantry. I mean, my pantry is not like that at all, <laughs> but it's just that kind of comfort that you have with thinking, oh, look, they have all of this food there and they made it and it's all, you know, it's got, you know, it's, sunshine of the past summer and stuff in it and then they get to eat it and share it with each other so i kind of like the mice pantry and <clears throat> kay and crystal and incis all shared recipes with us which again are in the chat so uh, kay do you want to tell us about the recipe that you shared uh so the recipe i shared is is called seasig which is in it usually uses up parts of the of pork that you wouldn't be able to use in a like like it's almost like scraps so like the ears and the snouts and the the one that I shared it shows up in my book it's actually prepared in like a high like a fancy restaurant mm -hmm. so I I, I kind of wanted to share that just so I can talk about how this is something this is like a food that that came about just just so that you don't waste anything and it it grew from there like like it's now you know you can go to any restaurant like any filipino restaurant and be able to order that and usually like now the fancy versions have like you know high class meat meat like the pork belly and you know it's but but just like just showing that evolution that mm -hmm. that food in many cases is out of necessity and then it it can be like elevated from that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's like yeah. I, you think about like the Japanese blowfish dish which you, you know I always wonder like how how did somebody make this in the first place if it's you take a poisonous fish and you like figure out exactly to, how to, to butcher it and and cook it so that it's not poisonous but who figured that out how many people died along the way <laughs> yeah it's the test kitchen I'm worried about <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> By, by the way, Kay, um, I know you're always posting like Filipino dishes that you've cooked on Twitter and they always look so good. <laughs> they make no, me so jealous. They really do. 
That's like that's like the one cuisine I haven't found a restaurant for around town. So I need to like keep looking because I really want to try all of those things. You, the, I think the usual answer to that is you f- make some Filipino friends, and then one day if they love you enough, they will take you home and get their mom to like cook for you. <laughs> All right, that sounds good too. <laughs> Usually, like the best Filipino cooking is not in restaurants; it's it's at home. Yeah. How about Crystal? How about you? You want to tell us about your recipe? Uh, yeah, I sent I sent the Aberdeen butteries or rowies. I was looking for um, an alternative to hardtack because hardtack is not very interesting to write about. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Aberdeen Rowies were made um, by sailors in Scotland um, around Aberdeen. And it's like, um, almost like a croissant in its texture, but something about the way they do it, it's more shelf stable. It lasts for months and it was um, a traveling food for them. But because of all the butter and the lard, folded into the pastry they're actually quite good so it, it felt like a fun alternative to hardtack which um is just literally flour and water that's pressed into a, um, a cracker but the cracker is so hard that it, it's described as soldiers having broken it with the ends of their guns because they had to break it into shards and there's only so much interest you can get out of hardtack in a narrative sense so the rowies was something that I I tried and it sounded really good, so I made them. And they're actually quite nice. I was really impressed with how how much easier they are than croissant dough. <laughs> so yeah. that was cool. How about you, Antisar? Um, so the recipe I shared, um, I, I shared a, 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 it's called Chicken Tasties and I shared a, a vegetarian, vegan and gluten-free options as well. But, um, you know, it comes down to, we were talking about how uh, there are moments when your characters sit together and eat and there are these quiet moments and they talk about really important things. So uh, those recipes are from a scene in The Theft of Sunlight uh, where my character ends up um, on a rooftop before dawn with a thief um, and they have some, some like, <laughs> some emotional uh challenges they need to kind of work through and um (laughs) and it's this beautiful kind of moment because it's both a peace offering um from one to the other and a time for them to kind of just be quiet together and be like you know what neither of us is fighting for anything where no one's trying to kill us right now like we're actually just being human together and and this is really special like we haven't had a chance to do this before um so it it really kind of plays into that and and it's um the food is this kind of uh it's like a a, you have a dough casing with um spiced uh something on the inside either chicken or vegetables and then it's deep fried um so there are either variations of this all over the world there's samosas there's empanadas there's all these different things um, and so it was just kind of pulling from that cultural heritage. This is street food, um, but he did go and find the best uh, maker of this particular street food to bring uh, and probably bribe them because he wasn't bringing day olds either. Um, and, and so there's, there's, there's this whole language around what is the food and you know, he, who, is, who is bringing it. And, um, and then this kind of, uh, you know, just, um, connection that occurs through the sharing of that food and through kind of the forgiveness both of oneself and of others um, as you're as you're eating together. Um, so yeah, so I thought that was the the recipe I shared and and, and the reason that um, I picked that particular recipe. That that's beautiful. All right, we we're almost out of time, so I just want to grab. I just want to get some questions in before um, we we uh, have to close here, especially because Kay is on the next panel that starts in five minutes. Oh, no. So um, uh, there's uh, Nico compliments uh, Travis and says, flesh eater is so good. Thank um, you. <laughs> uh, Misty 306 says, it talks about Kay's um, 
meals on Twitter also. And she also says the Davabad trilogy by S.A. Chakraborty. Have you guys read that? And um, yeah. what do you think of those meals? They're incredible. Yeah, yeah. She, I, I have them. I meant to <laughs> show them. But yeah, she she did an incredible job describing that food in those books that's and, and you should follow her on instagram because i she do pictures of her she because she's a food she researches it yeah yeah and she makes the period the period accurate or as as much as she can yeah. to uh those books and it's fantastic and sometimes she shares the recipes and yeah yeah and, and the stories are amazing too so like you can't lose yeah. here <laughs> yeah great food fiction absolutely yeah um let's see oh someone someone says um let's see there's some back and forth about what the standard fantasy feast is um oh i guess that would be what, what angela was saying about the the stew and the cheese and the bread um something i'm guilty of throwing in my in my books um, and one aspect of that is also thinking about if you're writing outside of the medieval European setting, right? Like, what were standard foods? Because it probably wasn't stew necessarily. Right. Or if it was, it was or made bread. In a way, a different way, right? You know, so bread, bread, standard bread is such a blank term. Like, bread yeah. comes in <laughs> so many shapes and right. sizes and right. grains. And is it yeah. sourdough? Is it yeasted? Is it both? Is it is it soda bread? Is it like bread bread could be celebrated i like seeing bread when it's um done with thought mm -hmm. that's not to say that all all books that include bread are doing something wrong because there's bread has so much to offer is it a flat bread is it yeah <laughs> there's what green is it made out of is it made out of rice is it made out of barley is it made out of something else so is it rye, rye. is it wheat yeah. is it yeah oats it like bread has a lot to offer if we give it some thought yeah I think you have to, you do have to be more of a, of a cook and a baker to even begin to understand, because if you're just an end consumer of bread, aha, uh -huh, pun intended, um, then you don't necessarily know what actually is in it. So, and what actually, it, you know, was used to make how it. How hard right? or how easy it is to make. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah exactly search relatively easily right like if you're like okay, yeah. I'm drawing from this part of the world this climate like you can go and be like what kinds of breads are typical of these climates and cultures and mm -hmm. how do they make them and it, it it can it's you don't have to start with that knowledge to develop it relatively quickly and do a good job representing it one one thing i see get left out of fantasy is noodles too and like almost every culture has some kind of a noodle but you nobody ever eats Red noodles thing, yeah <laughs> i do <laughs> <laughs> well but you're on the panel because <laughs> you know noodles. Noodles oh yeah and mother then... pig coming this summer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag books with noodles <laughs> all right so you know what? We only have a minute left and Kay's got to run. So I'm going to wrap up things up. Thank you so much, panelists. You were all fantastic. This was, um, the, the, there was a ton of comments in the chat. So um, maybe you can go back once it's reposted and, and look through those. And I think this is the, for me, this is a fantastic way to close out the con and um, you made my day and you were all fantastic panelists. So this is great. And everybody, <clears throat> www.quarancon2020.com for schedule of remaining events. If you missed anything, all um, broadcasts are preserved on YouTube. So you can go back and watch anything that you missed. And there's merch available. Many of the authors have their books on sale. Um, that there's a link on that website. Many of the, um, there's also an artist's alley where you can go direct to people's stuff and get their things. And um, uh, I think that's it. So it's six o'clock, the church bells, I have a church next door to me and those bells are ringing. So we have got to say goodbye and good night and thank